Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and of course this is the uh, boss here, Shackleton. So, in this video, I want to kind of summarize and uh, follow up on the previous two videos where I looked at the effects of, you know, how much, how quickly and how significantly the Arctic will warm up when we've lost the sea ice, which means that we'll lose the refrigerator effect of the Arctic. Because there's a lot of ice up there now, and of course that's rapidly going, it takes a lot of energy to, to melt that ice. So a lot of the incoming, in fact, the vast majority of the incoming sunlight um, in the Arctic summer goes into melting the ice. It doesn't go into raising the temperature. So when there's no sea ice, obviously the temperature will significantly rise and the warming in the Arctic will greatly accelerate. And this is a really bad thing for the jet streams. They'll become unrecognizable and we're going to have trouble growing food. But one of the interesting things is um, is that, you know, the solar irradiation, solar radiation on the Arctic, you know, the sun's getting really low on the horizon by September. So losing Arctic sea ice in September doesn't have a huge effect on the warming for September, but it's the loss of ice in the summer months that is really key. So I'm going to talk about all of these effects. Um, and the papers I talked about before were published a while ago. So I'm going to talk about 2019 paper by the same authors as in the previous videos that I was discussing. And uh, they model what will happen when there's a complete loss of Arctic sea ice. They don't say when it will happen. You know, the models are all lagging and saying when it will happen but I think it's very high probability of happening, say within you know, less than five years, certainly less than a decade. So these are the previous videos. Um, this is my uh, paulbeckwith.net site. Please consider donating to support my work, my analysis, my videos, my education. Um, I'm going to really ramp and step things up this year. So um including um you know getting some professional help on social media trying to um you know get a much larger reach for my videos and uh more views on my website and uh youtube channel facebook twitter i use extensively mostly twitter facebook i'll use more often this year also things like Instagram and Quora and Reddit. So if, you're, if you have expertise in that area, you can um, you know, drop me a comment either on the website or in YouTube. Um, otherwise, you know, if everybody that watches my videos makes a point of subscribing to my website so when there's a posting, they get it, or to my YouTube channel, or both. But, you know, just sharing it, like go that extra step. And when you get a video, you know, share it to a friend who you haven't, you know, who doesn't follow my stuff. If everybody did that, you know, we could double my YouTube um, views. We could double the, you know, people that get email messages when I post on YouTube and on um, when there's posts to paulbeckwith.net. And also it will give me some funds to um, promote the site even more um, and to travel to more conferences and try to get better, you know, to be more proactive and get on, um, you know, t more TV shows and et cetera, stuff like that. I'll talk, I've had quite a bit of success on mainstream TV in Canada in the last few weeks. I'll talk about that um, in my next series of videos, which will be on the Australian wildfires. So the original paper, um, the 2014 paper by Pistone, Eisenman, Ramanathan, 
Uh, basically, it showed that the albedo in the Arctic had declined from 52%. So 52% of sunlight was reflected in 1979. That's from the snow on land, the Arctic being regions being defined as great uh, as 60 degrees latitudes higher than 60 degrees north. That reflectivity is from the off the ice, off of the open ocean, off the snow on land, off the land, and also off clouds. And this number has dropped to 48% by 2011. So between 79 and 2011, 1979 and 2011, it dropped from 52% to 48%. Okay, cloud cover did not significantly change. So it was mostly due to the loss of sea ice. And then in the second part of this video, I talked a little bit about this recent paper, um, which I got a whole a copy of thanks to Irina on Facebook. You know, to get past to get a copy because it's under paywall, behind a behind a paywall. Um, the average, if you had no clouds at all in the Arctic, the albedo in 1979 would have been th was 39 percent. So a cloudless Arctic. That's the reflectivity of the Arctic region north of 60 degrees latitude. In 1979 and with no sea ice at all that would be 14 percent okay and that would of the 14 that's averaged over the whole region that would mostly be you know over the land regions because um, this goes down to 60 degrees latitude so more clouds um, are not expected to compensate for for this loss um, and I'll talk in detail about those so Again, um, check out, you know, subscribe to my paulbeckwith.net site, share it with people, you know, help me get, get the message out. I can't do it all on my own. So let's talk about the paper now, Radiative Heating of an Ice-Free Arctic Ocean. This will run over several videos because I want to go in great detail over this. So the key points, the complete disappearance of Arctic sea ice would contribute an additional solar radiative heating of 0.71 watts per meter squared to the planet. Up to 2016, we have 0.21 watts per square meter of globally average solar radiative heating um, from 1979 to basically 2011 was the original paper, but then 2016, it's similar. So with no sea ice, there's going to be a huge increase in the warming. This is equivalent to a radiative forcing from 1 trillion tons of CO2 emissions. Now, if you talk about land use and fossil fuel burning since the Industrial Revolution, we've put in 2.4 trillion tons of CO2. So the complete disappearance of Arctic sea ice is going to add tremendous amounts of warming to the system. But again, it depends when the sea ice is lost, because even if it goes completely in September, September won't be the month where the forcing is highest. It will be the summer months where the sun is much higher, the angle of the sun is much higher, known as the solar zenith angle, the angle of the sun relative to, um, <coughs> relative to straight up. Um, and this additional heating would be an order of magnitude larger in the month of May than in the month of September, okay, with loss of sea ice in May. And this one trillion tons, that's equivalent to 25 years of emissions at present emission levels, about 40 gigatons per year. So those are the key factors, but let's go into the details. So obviously there's been dramatic Arctic sea ice extent in the last several decades. It, this has reduced the top of atmosphere albedo or reflectivity of the Earth. It adds, there, there's, more, there's therefore more absorption on the surface of the Earth, more solar energy added to the climate system on the Earth. Now there's substantial uncertainty regarding how much ice retreat and whole solar heating will occur in the future. How much ice retreat, you know, um, the models clearly are under, underestimating ice retreat. The solar heating, that depends on when there's ice gone, what, what happens to the clouds in the Arctic region. This is very relevant to climate projections, including the time scale for reaching the stabilization targets, if those are, those are still possible, which I don't think they are. So 
satellite observations are used in this paper. They estimate the solar energy that would be added in the worst case scenario if the sea ice completely disappears in the sunlit part of the year. If the clouds are constant, um, in other words, behave as they've been behaving, then the radiative heating would be 0 0.71 watts per square, per square meter relative to the 1999 baseline state. This would be the globally average heating. It would be about 22 watts per square meter locally in the Arctic. And again, this is 1, million, 1 trillion tons of CO2 emissions equivalent, which would be 25 years of um, effectively 20, it would add 25 years um, to uh, the, the, the warming. In other words, uh, 25 years of present emissions um, gives a certain radiative forcing and lo complete loss of Arctic sea ice um, does the same thing. It, so losing Arctic sea ice blows all of the climate models and projections off the table. Um, you know, they're, they're completely, might as well throw them out because they don't account for, they don't expect a loss of sea ice. Okay, so, you know, the two, two, two degrees and one and a half degrees Paris climate targets, you know, papers say, you know, these targets are increasingly difficult to achieve. With unchecked emissions, global warming will have a 50% probability of exceeding this threshold by 2050. I think this is absurd. You know, 2050, that's still 30 years out. We lose the Arctic sea ice, we blow through these numbers almost right away. Now, climate models suggest a wide range of levels of sea ice retreat associated with two degrees of warming, including the possibility that the Arctic Ocean becomes ice-free at the end of each summer. Okay, yet with some ice still remaining in the mid-summer season when solar insulation peaks. Now, sea ice, of course, it alters the Earth's energy balance a huge amount because open ocean surface has a low albedo and a, therefore the absorption of solar energy is about six times higher in the open ocean than it is in an ocean covered by sea ice with snow on the sea ice because the snow and, and ice have a high albedo. Okay, so it really affects the climate balance, the energy balance of the climate system so from 79 to 2011, the global mean increase in solar heating is 0.21 watts per square meter. And again, this is about, this is about a quarter of as large as the direct forcing from CO2 changes during that same period. So it's a huge impact. The Arctic is vital. Okay, so this study looks at what happens if the Arctic sea ice completely disappears during the sunlit portions of the year. Okay, so first of all, um, you know, the globe, when, when is the sea, Arctic sea ice going to disappear? You know, the models, you know, the models from the CMIP-5 coupled model intercomparison project, looking at many different models, comparing the results, are, are basically below. And these, these models are out to lunch. So this is the number of models, and this is the baseline ice extent in a million square kilometers. The observations are this line. So this is an annual average. Um, so it's about, uh, you know, in the middle of the winter, it's about 15 um, million square kilometers, dropping to, you know, very low in September. But the average over the year is right here, about the, um, that's about the 12, just over the 12 million square kilometer range. And the models are showing a spread over this. The sea ice sensitivity, which is the loss of ice in a million square kilometers, okay, per Kelvin, per, per Kelvin or per degree Celsius of warming, that's a global mean temperature change. The models are all out here, but you know, where it's about 3.3, .3, minus 3.3 .3 million square kilometers of loss per degree um, Kelvin or degree Celsius of warming. Um, so the models are nowhere near reality, and this is the global warming required for an ice-free Arctic. So the models hover about 8.7 on average, and observations, um, well, we, you know, this is, this is what the observations would say if you follow the observational trends and not the model trends. Okay, so I'm going to continue this in another video. Thank you for listening so far.